What's up and welcome into the coverage of the World Chess Championship match between the challenger Jan Nepomnyshi against the reigning champion Magnus Carlsen. Let's get ready to rumble. Nepomnyshi is in the white trunk, starts off with pawn to e4, which is expected, and Carlsen responds with pawn to e5, which is one of the ways for black to refute the first move pawn to e4, of course, if we're only talking on the very high level, because e5, which leads to the Rylo pass, which actually Carlsen went into on the next move, and here after bishop to b5 there are two unbeatable variations for black, it's either going into the knight of 6, which starts the Berlin defense, or going into the classical Rylo pass and doing something similar to what Carlsen did in the actual game. And again, on super high level, black has high drawish chances here, and that is why Carlsen plays this opening. After white goes bishop a4, and there goes knight to f6, white castles, so far we're just going over the main line of the Rylo pass, rook to e1, protecting this pawn on e4 so that it can be captured, black goes pawn to b5 to neutralize the bishop, and after that they castle. Here white plays the move pawn to h3, and I think there should be some penalty for high level players playing moves like that, because whenever I show games of the world championship matches to students, especially to kids, they always tell me, Igor, like, but you told us not to play moves on the side when our pieces are underdeveloped, and that we should first of all move pawns in the center. But then why do these world champions play a move like that? And it, I always kind of dislike answering this question, because indeed, normally you shouldn't play a move like that. But when the World Chess Championship challenger plays it, you can't say that it's a bad mistake, right? So you have to somehow justify it. And if we're talking about the Rylo Pass in particular, the reason for white playing this slightly weird move pawn to h3, as black is not even ready to jump with their bishop to g4, so that we can say that h3 guards the square. It's not there, because the bishop cannot jump over the pawn, right? It's against the rules of chess. And the reason for this is simply because white got sick and tired of playing this main line c3, which has been played a million times, and also white has not found the way to play for a win, really, if black goes for the martial counterattack here with the pawn to d5. And therefore white sometimes plays this move pawn to h3, just trying to somehow deviate from this main line. Alright, let's come back to the actual game where uh, Jan played pawn to h3 and Carlsen responded with knight to a5, which is a pawn sacrifice and while traditionally in the game of chess if you're sacrificing the pawn, you're trying to attack and get some activity for that, but in this case I'd say that it's actually the opposite situation. Black is rather trying to simplify the position and to keep it dry. And here I gotta say a couple words about both of the guys, uh, the challenger and the champ. So. Carlsen is known as a great endgame player, great positional player, and the way he wins his games is usually by outplaying his opponent in a long game and then winning somewhere in an endgame. While Nepomnesi is rather an opposite of that, he's a great attacking player, dynamical player, and he'd prefer having a position with different tactical shots, with calculations, and of course with an ability for him to attack. And that is why the Carlsen strategy for the match will, and probably should be, to keep it dry, which is of course something that we chess fans can complain about, as we're not happy about that, but for him to gain his crown, that's what he should do. And that is why he goes into this line where white wins the pawn, but black manages to trade off one piece, and after that he goes bishop b7, and after the following force and moves, uh, he can simplify the position further, actually, because now he's attacking this pawn on a4 with a knight and bishop, therefore white would need to protect it somehow. They cannot really do it with the knight, because in this case, black can actually push this knight away with a pawn, and after that still get the pawn back. Therefore, knight going to c3 does not really help, so let's take this move back, and instead play the move pawn to d3, which is something that happened in the game, if she played it, and now black can push with the pawn to d5, all right, which again forces one more exchange and simplification, which is something that Carlsen wants. Now Carlsen takes it here with a queen, takes d5, and reportedly he asked Nipomnishi to look aside, thinking that Nipomnishi will actually forget about g2, and Carlsen will finish the game right here. I'm just kidding here. Of course, Nepo will see it, and he played queen to f3, which is actually, strategically, so to say, a mistake, because it's always wrong against Carlsen to go into an endgame, just because he's such a great endgame player. Therefore, I'd say that for Nepo, it probably is better to play something like knight to f3 and keep the position more complicated. I'm not saying that this move is better, but it just keeps the position more alive, which is in favor of Nepomnishin. If he wants to win the match, that's what he should do, right? Because uh, Magnus doesn't love madness, 
that's what he doesn't love about chess and that's something that Nepo should really try hard to create and after going with the queen instead of the knights let me replace those pieces after going with the queen to f3 now Carlson can always take here on f3 and just get into an endgame instead he played bishop to d6 why does he play that well if you're following me for some time, then you know the rule to take is a mistake. And here you can see a classical example of just that. Both players say, hey, I don't want to take first. I want my opponent to do that and to help me. Because if white takes here on d5, that would help black to move their knight forward, which is a little accomplishment for black, right? And if white does it by their own move, they may feel slightly like a fool, right? Because you're going to help in black with your own move. And that is why black says, no, I don't want to take. I want to let white doing that. And that's one interesting thing that you can learn from them. Because I'm sure that a lot of the players would just automatically take here in a position like that. But Magnus keeps up the pressure by playing bishop to d6 and inviting white to take. And instead of doing that, Nepo is doing the same thing. He keeps up the pressure and plays a weird move king to f1. Of course, we can also see the level of their home preparation because king f1 is the move suggested by a computer and therefore it's very likely that Nepo is just following his home preparation. And here he again says the same thing. Hey, let you take this on f3 and my knight will no longer be attacked on e5 uh, so that that'll slightly help white. Now, what's the purpose of this move king to f1? All of a sudden it protects the rook on e1, and while it looks slightly crazy and unnecessary at the point, it actually does make some sense. Because imagine if the king is not there, like it used to be on the previous move, and the king is still on the g1, and why would play a natural move knight to c3? All of a sudden that would lose the game immediately, because queen takes e5 now comes, and this tactics is a discovered attack to the queen, and the black's queen is attacking the rook, that's important, so I cannot easily take here, because otherwise they would lose the rook. And if they take an e5 and instead, then after this exchange, the rook is hanging and after it goes back and bishop goes back, at the end of this line we can see that black has an extra bishop, therefore that's a clear win. Coming back to the actual game, Nipomnishi played king to f1 and here there is one more example of the same rule. Carlson plays rook to b8, the move that I'm sure not many players would play, but the idea is still the same. He's protecting now this bishop on b zone so the queen can move away freely without worrying for the bishop to be lost to white capturing it. And once again it kind of forces white to take here on d5, because let me take a move back and just facilitate this idea once again for you. Whenever you see such a tension between two pieces, what amateur players do, they immediately exchange, automatically. And what strong players do, they keep up the pressure, because they know that the way to win in chess is to force your will onto your opponent, to take the lead and to say, hey, I don't want to react, I want you to do what I want, alright? And that's why whenever you kind of force your opponent to do what he refused to do previously, that gives you already a slight psychological advantage, and also a chess advantage as well. As in this case, after white takes on d5, that helps black to put their knight in the nice central square, and possibly it can jump to b4 in the future and start attacking white. So if you know the chess rules, you can see that you can comprehend the games of these top world players, and it's not a mystery anymore. And by the way, if you want to advance your chess skills, now's the best time of the year to do so, because they actually play their first game on Black Friday, which is not a surprise, because Dubai is such a big shopping location. And in the Remote Chess Academy, we also have special offers where you can get any of our premium courses at 50% discount, and also get one more course for free. So if you can, if you want to advance in chess, that's the way for you to do that. You can get the details in the description below the video. And now let's come back to the game. Here Nepo played another little bit strange move, bishop to d2, but it makes sense because if instead white would play knight to c3, that fails to knight to b4, and now this knight is hitting this pawn, this knight on e5 is still a little bit hanging, and therefore white cannot protect his position anymore, so that would be just a blunder. So let's take a move back, and that's why he played bishop to d2 first. Now, if necessary, he's got the rook coming to c1 to protect the pawn on c2 in the future. Black plays pawn on c5 and we're getting the position here where it's really hard for white to make any progress because normally in an end game uh, you need to push your pawns forward. That's how you win a game. And by the way, that's another classical question that students ask me about. Uh, they say, hey Igor, but in the game of chess you gotta attack and checkmate opponent's kin, right? But then why do none of these guys are even trying, even closely, to do that? And that's the thing that 
you know, in order to attack the king and to check mate it, you gotta have a lot of pieces into the attack. And especially once the queens are already traded off, it's fairly hard to do that. And so they switch to plan B, which is for Carlson plan A, because he uses it in almost all of his games, which is to win a pawn, get into an end game, and hopefully promote this extra pawn into a queen and win after that afterwards. And so that's why they're hunting for pawns, which is a lot easier target for your attack. And yeah, that's that's how they play, basically. It's as boring as it is, you know, <laughs> we can't complain about it. That's how they play on high level, at least most, most of these guys. And for right here, they has this extra pawn on d5 without a counterpart, but of course it's really, really hard for white to somehow push it forward. And that is why white is kind of clueless of what to actually do. And after a considerable thinking, Nebel plays the move knight goes back to f3, which is not a move you normally want to play because it's a backward move, you're retreating with a piece, but the knight was a little bit shaky there, it's been under the attack of the bishop, and so Nebel just puts it into a safety. Carlson plays rook d8, also a kind of a little bit of waiting move, waiting for the white knight to come to c3 so that the black knight can land to b4 and start putting pressure onto the pawn. And here it's already fairly clear that white is probably not gonna win this game, is after knight c3 and knight b4, Nebo played another hard move, rook to c1. Hard not because it's difficult to find, it's, it's an obvious move, but just because you never want to play a move like that, because now your have a piece, a rook, is just standing here to protect this little pawn. And of course the rook is crying its eyes out. Therefore, you can already see that black is doing absolutely okay here. And just to say a couple words in general about the, this World Championship match and the chances of players, I find it quite interesting, because I remember some like 15 years ago or so, well, when Gary Kasparov was still dominating the arena, and people were wondering who's gonna be the next guy, who's gonna be the next champ. And there were a couple players uh, around like 13 years of age who were like just prodigies and were promising, and Carlson was one of them, he rushed to the top real quickly, Nakamura was another one, and he initially progressed pretty fast, but then at some point he kind of struggled to progress further, and then later even switched to becoming the YouTube streamer and Twitch streamer, and now he probably has no chance to become world champ anymore. And Carlson already played chess matches against world chess championship matches, I mean, against the other two prodigies, which is Karakin and Caruana. And Nepo is actually the final guy of these chess prodigies who are about the same age of Carlson. So that's the final challenge actually for Carlson, because if he wins this, it means that for his generation, he's like tall totally dominate the arena and there's nobody who can shake him. But Nebo has some chance because he's a dynamical player and in complicated position he's got an edge over Carlson. The challenge for him is just to get into those positions, which is not easy, but he'll definitely try. Alright, Carlson plays rook to c8, just to put the rook into a more active square. Knight goes to e2 here. Somewhat the bishop is looking here at the, at the knight. It's not necessarily that white is actually gonna trade, but Again, it's hard for white to actually make any progress. And black also starts to move back, just in case. Bishop e3, knight e7. Potentially the knight is ready to jump here. It's hard for both players to make progress, so they're just maneuvering here and there. Bishop f4, an attempt for Nipomnoshi to trade off one of black's two bishops, which is a good idea, generally speaking. When your opponent has two bishops, it's good to trade off one of them, because then he does not have the advantage of two bishops anymore, right? But the problem here is that Carlson says, okay, if I don't have two bishops advantage, let me trade off another one as well, and also to break up the one's pawn structure. So that now, after these trades, Carlson goes rook to c6, and the rook is possibly ready to come here and to start attacking these weak pawns. So, even though white solved the problem of two bishops, but now he's got into another problem of having weak pawns. Rook comes to e1, attacking the knight, knight goes here to f5, looking at the d4 square, and from here it'll attack a lot of pawns here, therefore in order to prevent this, Nepo plays pawn to c3, which also weakens the, the pawn on d3, so it has a drawback as well. Knight h4, Carlson is starting to put pressure into this pawn, rook to e3 to protect it. It's already clear that Nepo is on a defense here, which is a warning sign actually, because when you're playing white, you normally want to push for a win, not to be a defender, but here Carlson managed to turn the table, and now it's rather that he has the initiative. King comes to f8, just in case, to avoid, you know, any back rank problems in the future. Nepo plays knight to g2, trying to eliminate this time from h4 because it's putting pressure onto this pawn. 
The knight goes here to f5, attacking the rook, rook comes to e5, the knight is protected, here he played knight to e1. Of course, that's another move that you never want to play, because in this case white spent a bunch of moves just to relocate his knight from one bad position on b1 to another bad position on e1. But he has to, because he wants to protect this pawn. Black plays knight to g7, just trying to somehow relocate the knight maybe somewhere here to put more pressure onto the white's pawns. Of course, it's a very slow thing, but that's what Carlsen is actually a master of, maneuvering here and there, looking for his chances in the endgame. Rook e4, pawn f5, driving it away. Knight comes to e6, and knight comes back to g2. After this game, the knight should definitely ask for a pay rise, because he's doing all the dirty job here, guarding the white's position and jumping all around, while the other white species doesn't really do much. And Carson plays b4, looking for the second weakness. That's another chess principle. When your opponent kind of fully defending his position, you want to create one more weakness to stretch out his defense. And here's what Carson is going to do. He tries to open up the b-file so that he can start attacking there. It's again quite remarkable that black, being a pawn down, is kind of pushing for a win. White goes king to e2, and now rook comes to b8 to trade off here, and after that to grab this pawn on b3. And now white has nothing to do but to sacrifice this pawn, because he's forced to, and after rook takes, which is an accomplishment for black really, because he, now the material is even, and black has never has to worry about a possibility to lose the game. King comes to c2. The interesting moment here is that black can't, can't double rooks here, because it fails to rook to e6 tactics. And now if rook comes here, the king can take the rook, which is left unprotected, and white is a piece up. Of course, Carlson doesn't do that, so let's go back. Instead, Carlson plays rook to b7, and now pawn to h4, which is also more of a defensive move, prevents the knight from coming here, potentially, and also white wants to push, maybe, and to trade pawns, because when you're a defender in an endgame, it's good to trade off all the pawns, because if you can get rid of all of them, it is just a draw, right, technically, so <laughs> that's what you do. Black goes king to f7, and here white played rook to e1, saying that maybe I'm gonna play rook to b1 and find for the open file. Here Carlson played king to f6, and it's actually interesting that he played that move, because it would be very much in Carlson's style to play something like rook c to b6, trying to get rook to b2 check, and here a lot of the normal players would play rook to b1, one of the rooks, saying, hey, I want to also oppose my rook there, but it's actually a bad mistake, because now, after a massive trade on b1, Carson's got to move pawn to g5 to break through on the king side, and now after an exchange, not only this knight is handy, but more importantly, black has this very strong passed pawn, which is going to be really, really hard for white to deal with, and this position is probably actually winning for black, or at least they've got great chances, because they have two pawns on the side of the board, where White will have a hard time controlling both of them. That's actually exactly how Carlson wins the majority of his games, you know, doing something like that, where his opponent thinks that it's almost a draw, but Carlson says, hey, not almost, and not a draw. <laughs> okay. Okay, coming back to the actual game, that whole thing didn't happen. Carlson played safe, he played king to f6, which is a safe move. Again, rook to b6 would be an attempt for black to play for a win, if black really wants to do it in this game. So rook b1 would be a bad mistake, they would have to cover this b2 square by playing rook to a2, and then black can try pushing the pawn, taking advantage of the rook, which is overloaded, it cannot go away, or else it would allow rook to b2. And so that would lead a more complex game, so black can keep pushing this pawn forward and somehow threaten to invade here. And I'm not saying that black can win here, of course, it's still very complicated and objectively it should be a draw, but black could try pushing for a win, which he didn't. And that's another interesting moment, because it shows that Carlsen is not that overconfident as he may come across as being a world champion, sitting there on the throne for many years, but we can see that he's also trying to play cautious and not really ready to take much risks. Alright, coming back to the game, here in this position he played king to f6, which leads to a boring position, now knight comes to e3, rook comes to d7, and knight, knight to c4, finally this knight, after a very long journey, landed on c4. Of course, somebody may wonder, why not to go there from b1 into two moves instead of doing that in 20 moves, but that's life, not always it's that easy. And now it's actually White finally managed to somehow stabilize his position. Now from the c4, the knight is ready to jump somewhere here or here and disturb black. And so black played rook e7, which is an invitation, a silent invitation to a draw, because white has the repetition here. 
I can repeat moves like that. And Black cannot avoid this because the rook can never go away from here because it has to protect the pawn on a6. And so it was a draw, which is kind of an accomplishment for Black, of course, because somehow instead of being a defender and holding the position, Carlsen was rather an initiative player here trying to push for a win. On the other hand, we can see that he didn't try his best. He didn't go all out in the first game trying to really maximize his winning chances. He was also cautious. So I'm still looking forward to the next games and think that they are going to be interesting because if Nepo is going to win this match, he's got to play more aggressively and he's going to look for crazy positions, which is something that we as fans will greatly appreciate. So stay tuned, I'll cover the next games for you as well. So write it down in the comments below if there's anything more specific that you want me to share about these games or these players. And also don't forget that there are just a couple days left for our special offer, so if you want to advance your chess, that's the great time to do so and click the link on the screen or below the video and take advantage of our Black Friday offers. Wishing you all the best. Have a great rest of the day.